Thank you. I was told to stand here. So uh, those of you in front, I don't mean to be overbearing, but this is where I was told to stand, and so this is where I shall stand. Here I stand, I can do no, uh, no, forget <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, let's see, I am, uh, yes, as Father said, I've, I've taught at uh, Biola University for quite a few, number of years. I, I was also a student there, uh, class of 88. I have, um, uh, and I, I taught in the Tory Honors Institute, and as Father says, I, I teach in a great books program in uh, Houston Baptist University in the Honors College. And, uh, and, you know, it's an interesting. When, I, when I'm in Houston, I miss L.A., but when I'm here in L.A., I, I miss Houston. I, I don't know. I just can't be content anywhere, I suppose. But anyway, um, before I... Uh, if, let me just make a few disclaimers here. Um, if you are expecting a scholarly presentation with uh, lots of footnotes and... Um, and, uh, and, and basically a dissertation, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. Likewise, if you're expecting to hear from someone who is advanced spiritually and has all this wonderful spiritual wisdom, again, I am going to disappoint you. I am not, uh, I, there's a reason why I have to go to confession so, so often every week. Just ask Father. Well, he's not going to tell you my sins, but... <laughs> Uh, when I, uh, actually, no, I'm so holy that I go, and when I, uh, when I go, I, I say, bless me, Father, for you have sinned. <laughs> or others have sinned. I'm holy, but uh, no. Anyway. Uh, today, I've been, I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about the, um, uh, the theme of watchfulness in the Desert Fathers. And before I launch into that, I, I was, um, I'd, I'd like to talk, I'd, I'd like to uh, recite the last few lines of T.S. Eliot's uh, J. Alfred Prufrock uh, poem. Uh, you may not, uh, you, you may not get the immediate uh, tie-in uh, here, but, but I think by the end you may. Because T.S. Eliot, especially in the Wasteland, J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, much of his poetry uh, deals with the despair of modernism. And it really comes out here in the last few lines. You know, in, in, in J. Alfred Prufrock's, uh, uh, the, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, there's a lot of randomness. Um, and, uh, but it ends this way. I grow old. I grow old, I shall wear the bottom of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them writing seaward on the waves combing the, the hair, the white hair of the waves blown back when the, winds, when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. I think, I think you could hear the despair there, right? Uh, you have these images of enchantment, but modernism has sucked enchantment right out of the human spirit. And, and, and uh, T.S. Eliot's poetry kind of captures that uh, to, uh, to a great degree. So I want to start with despair. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, because much of what the Desert Fathers talk about is, in terms of watchfulness, can be boiled down to an exhortation to beware of that one demon that, can, that is so soul-destructive, and that, uh, uh, known as despair. 
And uh, so, the, so, so the theme of watchfulness is, 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 is sort of tailored. Uh, and my talk on watchfulness in the Desert Fathers is kind of tailored towards that end. And that's why I, there's no better way to start, and thank you, Brian Roach, for that suggestion. I have to give credit where credit is due. He said, uh, he, he uh, suggested that I, be, that I begin, perhaps, with uh, uh, a little bit of a recitation of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, because it, it ties in so beautifully with this, uh, this, this theme of watchfulness. You know, wh whenever you talk about watchfulness in the spiritual life, you know, you're, you're watchful over pride, you're watchful over lust, you're watchful, you know, especially uh, thoughts that, 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 that may occur to you. you know? and, and the theme of watchfulness in the desert, in, in, in patristic literature, is designed to, to, to uh, especially to keep watch over your thoughts, your thought life, which is, way, which is basically the window wherein temptations, wherein uh, the, the, the assaults of the devil, the world, the flesh of the devil takes place. It's, it's at the level of thought. That's where it begins. So the monastic uh, movement in Egypt brings us to a whole body of writings dealing exactly with this, with spiritual combat. The word ascetic itself comes from the Greek word askesis, uh, which can mean fight, struggle, or contest. An ascetic, then, is one who fights, one who struggles, one who engages in a contest. It has athletic connotations as well as an athlete prepares for a contest of strength and endurance by training himself in order to fine-tune his body for an, for an athletic event. For those of you who are in sports uh, or any kind of athletic, uh, uh, athletic uh, 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 endeavor, you understand this uh, pretty readily. Uh, you have to engage in if you're, a, if you're an athlete, you have to engage in a lot of training, a lot of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, doing stuff that you don't find very pleasant, right? And, you know, it, you, uh, perhaps you, you would rather spend your time, uh, I don't know, sleeping. But sleeping is not going to prepare you for that great event that you are going to be, uh, uh, that, that you're going to be engaged in, if, especially if you want to do well. What motivates individuals to leave their homes and comforts, to leave the homes and comforts of civilized life, to pursue a life of deprivation in the scorching Egyptian desert? This is precisely where monasticism begins. And it's interesting that monasticism begins in Egypt precisely um, uh, towards the end of the Great Persecution, right? At the end of the, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, uh, St. Anthony is actually an interesting uh, uh, connecting figure here. He's a bridge figure between the age of the Great Persecutions, especially under Diocletian, the, the worst of the persecuting emperors, uh, the worst and, and basically the last, and, uh, and the monastic movement, because, you know, mona uh, persecution is, is deemed in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in the first three centuries of the church's existence as a form of imitatio Christi, a form of imitation of Christ. And uh, it is it is presented in much of the, uh, of, the, of the martyrologies as almost as an athletic event. The martyr standing in the arena and uh, facing his fear by the power of God and facing his biggest opponent, not the Romans, right? Not the Romans, but the powers that control the guards and the Romans, uh, you know, that, that, and their tormentors. It's directed, the combat is not against their tormentors, but against the spiritual forces that lie behind their tormentors. But 
after persecution, what happens, right? And, um, Eusebius paints an interesting picture in, in his, uh, in, in his uh, church history about, uh, you know, the, the end of the persecution in the Constantinian age. Now being, Chris, being a Christian is cool. Now being a Christian uh, gets you into the highest rungs of imperial favor. You know, Christianity becomes at, at one point a persecuted uh, uh, faith to a now most favored faith, not, not the official faith of the empire. That's going to come later, right? Uh, Constantine does not make Christianity the, the, the official religion of the empire, but he makes it the most favored. And that means bishops are dining with the emperor, and Eusebius is, you know, dancing, you know, he's, he's dancing in the streets over this. But, you know, uh, at the same time, there is Anthony. And Anthony, as I said, is an interesting bridge figure between the age of persecution and the, uh, and the rise of monasticism in Egypt. Uh, he is he is the son of an of a uh, of um, of prominent Alexandrian um, uh, a prominent Alexandrian merchant and uh, and family. He is, but he has this this he has a, as a young man he has a desire for martyrdom. So much so that he would actually go, uh, you know, when when there were imperial guards. Uh, so, so Saint Athanasius tells us, uh, he he stands in front of marching imperial guard, imperial uh, soldiers, and he is making all kinds of signs that he is a Christian. He's saying, "Take me, I'm a Christian. Please, here I am." He's you know, he's making signs of, of the, they're probably making signs of the cross. He is uh, he's, he's he he is just yelling and screaming. To these, uh, to these passing soldiers that he is a Christian. But what do the soldiers do? They just march right past him and do nothing. And, Ath and Athanasius says that the reason for that is because, well, God had, uh, God had him, what was preparing him for something else. And what was that something else? Well, one day during, the, during, uh, during liturgy, he hears the, the, gospel, the, the gospel reading uh, in, from the Gospel of Mark saying, if you will follow me, sell all that you have, give to, give to the poor, and follow me. And he says, that's what I want. That was the defining moment of his life, and he does exactly that. He sells, after the death of his parents, he, he sells his property. He, um, he sells, uh, he, he, he gives away all of his possessions. He puts his sister in the care of some virgins, of a community of virgins, and guess what he does? He goes out into the desert. What does he do with the desert? Well. He goes and engages in the biggest ascetic struggle of his life. Through prayer, fasting, more prayer, struggles with demons, more struggle. Uh, his purpose for going out into the desert was not to escape. Rather, it was to confront. It was to confront the world, the flesh, and the devil. It was to, uh, especially to confront it in himself. And at the time, deserts were understood to be these very desolate places where demons and robbers uh, abided. So, um, Orthodox theologian and churchman, Metropolitan Callistos Ware, gives the best definition of an ascetic uh, in, in the mold of St. Anthony the Great. An ascetic, he says, retreats to the desert for two things, to confront demons and to find God. Though that's it. 
That's what desert ascetics did. And with the end of persecution, um, you know, when, when, when the government is no longer seeking you out to kill you, well, what other forms of ascetic, of, uh, of, of combat is there? Well, there is the ascetic kind of combat. Uh, and and uh, St. Athanasius makes the, makes the, um, the argument uh, in his life of Anthony that for Anthony, that would prove to be an even greater contest for him than, act than, 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 than the very quick event of, of laying down your life uh, in an act of um, martyrdom. Why? Because it's a lifelong, you know, fighting demons and, seeing go and trying to see God is a lifelong struggle. It's not a quick thing. It's not. It's not something that's going to, uh, you know, it, 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 it's. It's not something that that happens at the drop of a dime. It's something that is a lifelong struggle. And that is what motivates people like Saint Anthony. Um, and. After St. Anthony and, and also uh, other, other, other de desert ascetics like uh, St. Pacomius, uh, a series of collections of their sayings begin to accumulate. They have, they have disciples. In the case of Anthony, Anthony can't get away from people, right? Everyone, everyone is, is coming after him, uh, trying to learn something from him. And, and you know, he, he, he forms a few communities and then he goes even deeper into the desert, right? Um, and uh, and people are, but no matter how deeply into the desert, into the Egyptian desert he's going, people are still going after him. And uh, he does a little bit of teaching, and then and then he goes deeper still into the desert. You know, he, he can't get deeper, deep enough into the desert to. Um, uh, you know, the, for him, there's no there's no desert too deep to go to, to go into. So the, the sayings of the desert fathers are collections of wise counsels and exhortations concerning the spiritual life of, uh, and ascetic struggle. These sayings are the collected wisdom of various monks and and ascetics of the of the Egyptian desert, ranging from Anthony to Macarius, and some are known only to God. One might expect them to be a bit austere and harsh, but when we plunge into their sayings, we find them to be very gentle and pastoral. That's the thing about the desert. If you've ever read the De Desert Fathers, they're very gentle. Right? You would ex again, you would expect an ascetic to be this very harsh and very uh, demanding sort, but, uh, but they understand human weakness. When you look at, when you uh, read the writings of the desert, or the sayings of the desert fathers, you see individuals who are very advanced spiritually, but never forget human weakness. And always relate to, to their disciples on their level. That's an important thing to keep in mind here. And, and what that does is that it, it banishes um, despair. That is the one thing that the Desert Fathers will always warn you about, and that is despair. They are indeed a comfort to the afflicted, but they can also be a very fierce affliction to the comfortable. Right? A comfort to the afflicted, but, a, but, a, but an affliction to the comfortable. So, since my talk is on watchfulness, let's first uh, establish a definition. Watchfulness comes from the Greek word uh, nepsis, or, or actually the Greek word that's used for watchfulness is nepsis, is defined uh, in the Philokalia as the opposite to a state of drunken stupor. Hence, spiritual sobriety, alertness, vigilance, And uh, when I made that emphatic remark, I lost my... Oh, here I am. 
It signifies an attitude of attentiveness, whereby one keeps watch over one's inward thoughts and fantasies, maintaining guard over the heart and the intellect. Thus, keeping watch over the heart, the intellect, uh, or the intellect, keeping watch over our thoughts becomes the central theme in much of their spiritual writing. The word translated as intellect is the word noose, N-O-U-S. It is a very hard word to translate from Greek. Jer Saint Jerome had no word in Latin that was equivalent uh, other than the word census. Uh, which translates into understanding or reason in English. Consider Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed in the newness of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. This is how the Greek reads, and I will highlight the key word nous here, which is declined in the, net, uh, in the genitive singular. Kai, uh, kai me, uh, I'm not, not going to read that whole thing. Um, it's in, it, it, it's in Greek. Uh, I'll, I'll show it to you. But the word for, the word, the, the Greek word, again, in, that's used in the actual Greek word is, 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 is the word nous. It, and it is a word in, that in later uh, patristic literature would come to mean that highest faculty in man, which, prov which provided it, it is purified, he knows, whereby he knows God or the inner essences or inner essences or principles of things by direct apprehension or spiritual perception. It is different from reason or dianoia, which is another Greek word. Uh, the, the Greek word dianoia denotes reason as we commonly understand it, right? Discursive reason, you know, syllogistic reason. Uh, a, uh, if A, then B, therefore, you know, you, you, you get what I'm talking about. That's dianoia, but that is not noose. Uh, it is different from reason or dianoia since the noose does not function by formulating abstract concepts and then arguing on this basis, and then are, uh, uh, to, a, to a conclusion reached through deductive reasoning. <laughs> but it understands divine truth by means of immediate uh, experience, intuition, or simple cognition. That's noetic knowledge, a direct apprehension of spiritual truths, right? It's kind of like looking at your own image in a mirror. For some of us, that would be a horrific experience. Uh, I'm only speaking for myself here. You're, you're all very good looking here. I'm sure that's not a, that, that's no, uh, that, that's not a, uh, a horror for any of you. But for me, I mean, anyway. Um, I, you know, if you look at your own image in the mirror, you don't have to think about it, right? How many of you have gone through, when you look at yourself in the mirror, how many of you have gone through a syllogistic reasoning, right, to, to conclude that that is your image? No, you don't, right? Uh, if you do, I, then you're weird. <laughs> you're just weird, okay? <laughs> um, not, you know, you don't do that. You just know that that's you. That's your image. Um, the news... Uh, 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 apprehending spiritual truth uh, through, through, through your noetic faculties is a lot like that. You, you receive it immediately. You, it, it is a direct apprehension of, tru of spiritual truths um, that, 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 you, uh, that, that you experience. Spiritual knowledge to the Desert Fathers is a matter of deep experience a knowledge that goes beyond discursive knowledge, logic, and a reception of divine knowledge directly into the heart. This being the case, the Desert Fathers admonish us to guard this organ where direct spiritual apprehension occurs. 
Since sinful thoughts darken the soul, obscuring the divine light, with the turning of our minds, i.e. our noose, as Romans 12, 2 tells us, the soul is enabled to receive divine truth, and so the whole soul becomes a bearer of divine light. The guarding of our thoughts is key to make our souls receptive to the reception of divine knowledge. It's kind of like a house, right? Let's say there's a house with a single window. Now, if the, if the house is turned away from the sun, and you, again, you have only one single window there on the house, then, and, and it's turned away from the sun, what's going to happen? Yeah, yes, the, the, the house will be, dark, will be in darkness. And so, much of what the ascetic literature admonishes us to, to do, uh, and, and, and the writings of the, of the Desert Fathers admonish us to do, is to turn our minds, turn our noose to the sun, turn our noose to the divine light, so that through that we can apprehend divine truth and that it, and, and that it illuminates our whole being. Having said all this, it would almost seem like the Desert Fathers are, again, are a bit stern. But when we read them, we find them quite gentle and pastoral. The reception of divine knowledge and the turning of the noose is something that requires great practice and, most importantly, great patience. And they are very much understanding of human weakness. Here's one example. So I've collected... A, I've, collected a few, um, a few sayings here, a few examples of just how, uh, of just how, um, how pastoral they are. Here's, here's an anecdote from the sayings of the Desert Fathers. There was a certain brother who was most zealous in ordering his life. And when he was grievously troubled by the demon of sex, i.e. lust, he went to a certain old man and told him his thoughts. When this expert heard, he was indignant and called the brother a miserable wretch, unworthy of the monk's habit to entertain, to entertain such thoughts. Bad boy. Right? So that's the stern kind of approach. The brother, hearing this, departed of it, despaired, there's that demon, right? Despaired of himself, left his cell and began to go back to the world. But by the mercy of God, Abba Apollo met him, and seeing that he was upset and unhappy, he asked him, Brother, why so sad? In great confusion of mind, he was at first unwilling to answer. But in the face of much questioning by the old man as to what the matter was, he, was, he last confessed, saying, I am bothered by thoughts of sex. And I, and I confessed to that old man, and according to him, there is no hope of salvation for me. So in despair, I'm going back to the world. When Father Apollo heard this, he talked and reasoned with him like a wise physician, saying, don't be too dumbfounded or despairing of yourself. Even at my age and state of life, I can be greatly troubled by thoughts such as these. Don't collapse in this time of testing. It can be cured not so much by human advice as by the mercy of God. But just for today, grant me one request. Go back to your cell. This the brother did. Abba Apollo, however, hastened to the cell of that old man who had sown despair and standing outside, prayed the Lord, Lord, who allows us to be tempted for our good, turn the battle which this brother has suffered against this old, against this old man that in his old age he may learn from experience what he didn't long 
learn long since that you, that you must have compassion on those who are troubled by this sort of temptation. Basically, Abba Apollo is asking God to tempt that old man, to allow the temptation to come to that, to, to come to that old man, to allow, allow the demon that has been afflicting that young monk to afflict him for a little while, just to teach him a little lesson. Now, here's the rest of it. Having completed his, his prayer, he saw an, a dark figure standing by the cell casting arrows against the, this old man, who, severely wounded, began to stagger about here and there as if drunk with wine. Unable to bear it any longer, he rushed out of the cell and began to return to the world by the same road as the brother had taken. But Abba Apollo, knowing what was happening, met him, and running up to him asked, Where are you going? And what is the, the reason for the agitated state that you are in? But he, sensing that the, the holy man knew all about what was happening, could say nothing for very shame. Go back to your cell, said Abba Apollo, and acknowledge your own weakness. Recognize it, recognize it as part of yourself. For either you have been overlooked by the devil up till now, or else despised as being so lacking in virtue as to be unworthy of striving against him. Did I say strife? You weren't even able to put up uh, uh, he, uh, with his attacks for a single day. Notice what he's saying here. In, in, between the lines he's saying here, you know, this young brother that you so condemned, he was struggling, but, but he kept his virtue. What, if, what do you do? When you're just tempted a little bit, what do you do? You go to, you, 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 you can't get to the nearest brothel fast enough. <laughs> right? So, who's the real ascetic struggler here? Right? But all this happened to you because when that young man was attacked by our common adversary, Instead of giving him help, helpful advice against the devil, as you ought, you drove him to despair. Uh, forgetful of that wise precept by which we are bidden to save those on a pathway towards death and neglect not to redeem the condemned. Nor have you heeded the sayings of our Savior, a bruised reed he shall not break and a smoking flax he shall not quench. No one can, can withstand the attacks of the enemy or quench the con and contain the fire of rebellious nature unless the grace of God come to the aid of our natural infirmity, which in all our prayer we beg God in his mercy to heal us, and that he may turn away from us the attacks launched against us, for it is of him that we are cast down and again restored to the way of salvation. It is he who strikes and then heals us with his hands. He humbles and exalts. He kills and he makes alive. He leads us down to the depths and raises us up, up again. Having said this, he prayed and at once the old man was freed from that battle. And Abba Apollo urged him to seek from the Lord a tongue of discretion so that he might know when the time was right for giving a sermon. End quote. That was a rather long quote, but I think, I think you found it rather instructive. At least, I hope you did. The young man was confront, com comforted <coughs> by Abba Apollo but the abbot learned a valuable lesson in not being judgmental of human weakness. Whereas the young monk struggled against temptation, the abbot didn't seem to put up a, much of a fight when, uh, when he was similarly tempted. This story should offer hope and encouragement to get up when one is knocked down in spiritual combat. Get up and keep fighting, the Desert Fathers tell us. 
That is the way of repentance. And the way of repentance is linked intimately to the diligent practice of vigilance over one's thoughts. A clear statement of the supreme importance of watchfulness is, is given by Abba, Abba, uh, the abbot Agatho. Abba Agatho was asked, which is more difficult, bodily discipline or the guard over the inner, ma or, or the guard over the inner man? The Abba said, man is like a tree. His bodily discipline is like the, the leaves of the tree. His guard over the inner man is like the fruit. Scripture says that every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So we ought to take every precaution about guarding the mind, i.e. the noose, because that is our fruit. We need to be covered with beautiful leaves the bodily discipline. There is an innate connection between discipline and vigilance. But the most important thing to keep watch over is our thoughts, since, since it is from there that action flows. And if the mind is full of light, the light of grace, then our actions will bear the right fruit. Control your thoughts, and your body will follow is the object lesson here. The, fathers always ex the, the Desert Fathers always exhort us never to play with an evil thought, never to entertain it, rebuffing it as soon as it makes its presence known is the mark of vigilance. Again, from the sayings of the Desert Fathers. A hermit used to say, a lustful thought is brittle like papyrus. When it is thrust at us, if we do not accept it but throw it away, it breaks off easily. If it allures us and we keep playing with it, it becomes as difficult to break as iron. We need discernment to know that those who consent lose hope of salvation, and for those who do not consent, a crown is made ready. The last sentence gives us a dire choice. Consent to the thought and lose salvation, or fight it off. Block it and gain the crown of salvation. Those are the stark choices offered to us. The stakes in this spiritual combat are high. It is nothing less than the salvation of our souls. I mention again the pastoral nature of the of the, uh, of the Desert Fathers, and perhaps a question might occur to us, what happens if we consent to these thoughts and are overcome by our passions and evil desires? Get up and fight again is the answer. In other words, never lose hope. A brother asked a hermit, what can I do? My mind is always thinking about fornication and does not let me rest even for an hour, and my heart is suffering. So the hermit said to him, when the demons sow thoughts in your heart, and you feel this, don't listen to your heart. For that is the demon's suggestion. There, there was an 80s song called Listen to Your Heart, if you all remember. Some of, uh, some of us uh, who came of age in the 1980s will remember it. Now it's playing through my mind and it's probably not going to stop uh, for quite a while. But, um, but uh, that's, that's the mantra of our age, right? Listen to your heart. Well, the, uh, the Desert Father says, actually, no. Especially if demons are putting things in your heart, right? Don't, do, don't, just don't, right? Though the demons are careful to send thoughts to you, they do not force you to accept them. It is up to you to receive or reject them. Do you know what the Midianites did? They decked their daughters and set them where the Israelites could see them. But they did not force them to intermingle. Uh, it was as, it, as each one wished. Others were wrathful and uttered threats. 
and avenged the act of whoredom with the death of those who dared uh, to do it. That is what should be done um, when lust rises in us. But the brother replied, what am, I, what am I to do if I am weak and this passion masters me? The hermit said, this is the way to be strong. When temptations start to speak in, you, in your mind, do not answer them, but get up, pray, do penance, and say, Son of God, have mercy upon me. But the brother said, look here, Abba. I meditate on, on such words, but they do not help me to be penitent, for I do not know the meaning of the words on which I am meditating. The hermit said, well, go on meditating. I have heard that uh, I, the abbot Piman and other monks said that a snake charmer does not know the meaning of his words, but the snake hears them and knows their meaning and obeys the charmer and lies down. So though we do not know the meaning of the words, the demons hear and are afraid and flee. The main lesson to be drawn here is never to stop fighting, even if you succumb to the weakness. Even if in a moment of, of weakness you consent, don't let that consent become a habit. But get up, dust yourself off, and keep fighting. Repent and keep watch over your soul and keep meditating on the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner, which has power in and of itself to rebuff the serpents of evil thoughts. All of this watchfulness, of course, presumes a supernatural act of divine grace that helps us uh, as, we, uh, as we keep watch and helps us up when we fail to do so. As the psalmist says, unless the Lord keep the city, we, he, wa he watcheth uh, in vain that keepeth it. All of our watchings over our minds, our hearts, our noose, would be in vain if God is not present. As St. Macarius says in his third homily, to uproot sin and the evil that is so embedded in our sinning can be done only by divine power. For it is impossible and outside man's competence to uproot sin, to struggle, yes, to continue to fight, to inflict blows, and to receive setbacks in your power. To uproot, however, belongs to God alone. If you have done it on your own, what would have been the need for the coming of the Lord? For just as an eye cannot see without light, nor can one speak without a tongue, nor hear without ears, nor walk without feet, nor carry on works without hands, so you cannot be saved without Jesus, nor enter into the kingdom of heaven. Sober and encouraging words are these especially as they inspire us to greater feats of repentance. Repentance involves a turning of our minds, metanoia, right, the turning of our minds to the divine light and keeping it focused on the light so that our souls can be filled with light. Standing guard over our thoughts, we don't stand alone, but God stands there with us, strengthening us with his grace, and ready to pick us up when we fall. The message coming from, from the uh, deserts of Scetus and the Tebed through the centuries and through a succession of faithful monastic athletes of prayer, east and west, is this. Always keep watch and never despair of the grace of God. Despair, even... E even above, e even more than keeping watch over the seven deadly sins, keep watch especially for that demon called despair. That is the message. That is the essential message of the Desert Fathers. Keep watch over despair. Don't let it. 
ever take, take hold of you. Despair is not the same. When the, and, and, you know, when the Desert Fathers talk about despair, they're not... Uh, it could be related, but they're not necessarily talking about clinical depression, you know, something that might have a chemical cause, right? Uh, they, no, they're talking about a, a spiritual condition, a spiritual condition that, that uh, basically uh, promotes sloth. And sloth is not mere inactivity, but actually a, um, a, a sort of uh, uh, attitude of not caring. You know, all of this is too hard. Why bother? Why bother, right? Why should I even bother with any of this? Um, you know, I'm just going to uh, dip into that one of those vats there and uh, get get stone drunk and uh, and and uh, go out with as many women as I can because heck, what's all this for anyway? That's despair. That is despair. I can't. You know, I can't do this on my... Well, nobody said that you're doing this on your own, right? Nobody said you're doing this on your own. Uh, uh, you have God standing there with you. And, uh, and, and so, if, if you come out with any... And this is, this is something... Um, part of the reason why I've given a talk on this is because I remember years ago when I was going to confession at a Russian church before um, I, I'd, I'd been uh, Eastern Orthodox before I was received into communion with Rome, uh, with, with the Holy See, and one thing that I had often, that I, you know, I, I was plagued by a sin that I kept repeating time and again. And I was, I was, uh, when my time for confession came, I, the I, I was I was met by by a, a rather rotund jovial Russian priest with with a beard that came down to here, right? And and so I thought, oh my, this this is this is a very heavy guy here. This is uh, I don't know what's what this what what kind of experience this is going to be. So, but you know, I I I, uh, I bowed down uh, before the icon. Uh, the, be, before the the, uh, the gospel book, the icon of of Christ and 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 the cross, and I begin to whisper my confession to him, and I said, you know, Father, I'm plagued by this sin all the time, and uh, you know, it, sometimes it's everything that, that I that I can do, you know, uh, not to despair. And I said, let me stop you there for one moment, right? You know, you, you talked about a certain sin that plagues you, and that, and that I understand. But you uttered a word that's probably the most scary word, uh, the, the, the scariest word you uttered today, right now, is the word despair. Uh, and my suggestion to you is, no matter how many times you may commit the same sin, uh, uh, provided that you have the intention to overcome, to, to keep overcoming it. Uh, uh, keep coming to confession. Please keep coming, but never despair. Never, ever despair. Um, that is the one thing that you should constantly and continually fight against. The demon of despair. Never despair of the grace of God because he does not despair of us. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions, but uh, Dr. Lisa will be with us on Sunday. If you saw the advertisements, we're following up with this. Uh, we started this uh, two months ago. On Sunday mornings at Blessed John Henry Newman, our parish, we're doing th what's called Theology on Perk, which is serving coffee instead of beer. But the speakers from each of these uh, monthly Theology on Taps will be with us to talk about, uh, uh, lead a really discussion on your questions 
uh, about the, the topics that he talked. We can answer a couple now, but uh, on Sunday we'll be able to dive in much, much deeper. So, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, you spoke of the desert, desert fathers. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there's any desert mothers in there. I know that St. Benedict of Nursia has St. Scholastic. Yes. So, is there anybody we can look to as a desert mother? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. St. Mary of Egypt is the one that comes to mind, right? You know, she, is, uh, she, she, she has an incredible story because she, is, um, she, was, she had been a prostitute uh, in Constantinople. Uh, she went to Constantinople, actually, to, and, and, and into the, uh, tried to enter the Church of the Holy Apostles in order to lure young men you know, to, uh, you know, away from the church, uh, for, from the liturgy, and, uh, and basically escort them into, you know, a night of revelry. But she could not, as she tried to, to go into the, the Church of the Holy Apostles in, um, in, in Constantinople, as she tried to enter, something kept her back, kept pushing her back again and again. Every time she tried to go, she kept... Uh, being pushed back. Uh, some, some invisible force kept pushing her back. Uh, until finally, you know, uh, at, uh, you know, she meets a priest and she, and, 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 uh, she, and, and, you know, justifiably she's frightened about this. Why can't I go to this church? What, what's, what's keeping me back? And she, it dawns on her that she's, that, uh, that uh, a divine force is keeping her back because she is trying to enter for all the wrong reasons. And it's, it is only when she goes with the intention of repentance that she is allowed in, and finally she's allowed in. And then once she is baptized and is uh, received the sacraments, she goes out into the desert and, uh, and lives out there a life of penitence, uh, continual penitence. And... Um, a monastery. It, it, this is this is in the Palestinian desert, and um, uh, a monk from a nearby monastery uh, gets uh, uh, hears about her, and he goes to to see what she was all about. And she had been living out in the desert for so long. You know, she she had been living out there that she was basically uh, naked. Uh, living out in the desert. So, so as soon as she sees the monk, she goes and hides it and, and tries to put whatever she could on. And then she tells him her, her story. And the priest finds it so edifying, so, you know, that, that this great penitent, this great ascetic uh, mother uh, is, uh, you know, fascinated and, and, and impressed by, by the life of holiness that she has led. Um, he writes it down. And, and soon enough, quite a number of other desert mothers follow uh, her example. So yes, there's plenty of that. Uh, Abba Macrina is another one. Um, uh, just so many. Uh, there, there's, one, there, there, there's also one um, story, and it's, it's from the Eusebius, where a woman is... Um, where he meets a woman who never left, never leaves her cell. And, and, he, and she's asked, don't you want to go on pilgrimages? You know, uh, don't you want to go out on pilgrimages? And, uh, and she says, in prayer, I make the greatest pilgrimage because I am in union with all. And I bring the world to God and God brings the world to me in this simple act of prayer. So... So yes, yeah, quite a bit. Yes. Anybody else? Yes, sir. And speak loudly, please. There are many uh, editions of the writing of the Desert Fathers. How should one decide whether to meet them alone or under the guidance of a spiritual director? Okay, good. Very good question. You know, uh, there are many... Um, Editions. He says there are many editions of the writings of the Desert Fathers. How does one know what to read on his, on one's own, and what to read with uh, a spiritual director? I have found that the Desert Fathers 
um, I think I think you gain a very good experience with them, given their pastoral nature. Um, uh, by oneself, certainly one could live, but and and one gets even more of an uh, of uh, experience with 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 a with a spiritual director. Uh, there's another. So, so you know, the, the Desert Fathers can be read very, you know, uh, uh, largely, on, at least that's been my experience. Now, there's another collection of monastic writings, ascetic writings, called it, uh, from, the, from the Greek tradition, uh, uh, known as the Philokalia. The Philokalia is basically, uh, you know, a lot of Greek Orthodox and... and, and um, uh, Byzantine Catholic uh, ascetics would basically caution you against reading too much of that on your own, because that's ascetic literature that is way, way, you know, very, very advanced. Um, more often than not, I, I and, and I think this is very good. This is very good. Um, uh, if you're a new convert, I think this is good advice. If you're a new convert, uh, begin simply with the Bible and the liturgy. <laughs> That's where you begin. The Bible and the liturgy and, and the office and the prayer offices, right? Um, and then read a little bit of the Desert Fathers. Read a little bit of the Desert Fathers. Some alone, some with some guidance, and, and I'm not sure there's a formula there that I could really point to uh, as to, you know, when to read alone and when to read with guidance. Um, uh, I, think, I think you'll know that at, at some point. Um, uh, but the Desert Fathers offer such basic pastoral advice that it's, uh, that, that it's usually very... Um, very safe, quote unquote, to, uh, to to read them and not despair. I've seen people kind of despair a little bit who weren't really ready for some of so, some of the writings in the Philokalia. Um, it's easy to kind of despair if you're, uh, but uh, and and of course there's it, again from the Greek East uh, uh, the Ladder of Divine Ascent uh, by Saint John Climacus. Uh, that is something you might want to put off for a little while, right? Um, and, and, and that's actually something you might want to read with guidance as well, right? But the point is for you not to despair. And, uh, and if you find that you despair from something that you're reading, put it down. Put it down and, uh, and go, back, go back to the basics, the Bible and the liturgy and the offices, Right? Go back to the sure things. Right? If you're finding that you're despairing, you just, just put it away. Which edition? Yeah. Which edition? Well, I have been, the one that I've, uh, that I've been re uh, pr reading most often is the one that has been translated uh, and uh, edited by Sister Benedicta Ward. Um, uh, uh, published by Penguin. Uh, that's that's the one that's most often available. So so that's a good one. That's a very good one. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.